All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for um, the Martin County Water Ambassador Program. Water Ambassador Webinar Program is a partnership between Martin County and the University of Florida IFAS and Florida Sea Grant Program. We are pleased to announce that we have filled all the slots for the rest of our webinar series for 2024. So um, be on the lookout for emails to register for all of our upcoming webinars. We're really excited about it. We also have um, two field trips coming up in September. Um, one will be visiting uh, the completion of the Martin County Ripple Project, which is um, a stormwater retrofit project that incorporates eco art and community engagement. So we're excited to be able to, to finally see the completion of that project. And then the, the second field trip is gonna be visiting the Florida Oceanographic Society uh, Seagrass Nursery. So be on the lookout, those are in September. So we will be sending out some field trip information as it gets closer to those dates. Um, for those of you who maybe have missed some of our previous webinars or won't be able to attend our future webinars, we do record all of the webinars and you can find them on YouTube. Um, it's probably easiest because the, the link is a little wonky, but we will put it in the chat. Otherwise you can just Google Martin County Extension YouTube and it'll, it'll come up for you. And that's where you can see all of our webinars from this year as well as from previous years. So it's a great resource. Um, we will be holding all of our questions to the end. So please, as our presenter is, um, is speaking, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will be getting to them at the end. And with that, I am super excited to um, be introducing our presenter today, Claire Lewis. Claire's been with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program since 2011, and she now serves as um, the director of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and the state specialized extension agent. Claire earned a master's of landscape architecture from the University of Florida, and she spent 12 years working for private landscape architecture firms in Gainesville. So she's got both the, the private and the sort of academic perspective, which is really unique. Um, her design projects include large-scale commercial, institutional, and residential home sites. And in her current role, Claire is responsible for educational outreach to local governments, building professionals, homeowners, landscape professionals, and community decision makers across Florida. So with that, I'm super excited to turn this over to Claire, who's going to be talking to us today about green stormwater infrastructure for the home. So thank you, Claire, and thank you so much for presenting with us today. Well, thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. Share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yep, looks great. Okay, super. Let's get started. So once again, I'm really happy to be here today. And um, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Claire Lewis, and I'm with the Florida Finley Landscaping Program. Today, I'm going to provide an overview of some of the common residential drainage issues that we see and provide some suggestions on how to address them through green stormwater infrastructure. And I'll explain what that is, too, as we as we go through this. Um, little next button. But first, what I'd like to do is um, to start off by talking briefly about how we ended up with some of the problems that we have. And um, this slide shows um, an example of an undeveloped natural Florida habitat, um, the one on the left. Then what happens is we'll clear the property and we'll, we'll start to get it ready for development. Um, we'll dig a stormwater pond and then we'll use that dredge um, to, to as fill and we'll use that to elevate the foundations for the roadways and the home sites and create positive drainage. Um, then next we have um, this image here shows, you know, a, a site that's platted and ready for development. Um, and then we will get our finished home. And a lot of them look like this, you know, with, you know, just, you know, just maybe turf and no landscape plants at all. Um, and this building process isn't always conducive for landscapes and plant material. 
The soil is often builder sand, um, so it doesn't really have many nutrients in it. Um, it can also be um, very compacted soil, which is also tough on plants. Um, and, um, you know, the construction activities themselves will also um, lead to some issues. There could be nails and concrete debris and just all sorts of paint type things. So, you know, all, all kinds of things are going into this, you know, landscape bed that's getting, you know, prepped. So those are just some of the issues that, that our landscapes have to kind of deal with as they're newly installed. Um, this next images um, are, are regarding drainage in a site. So these red arrows indicate the way the water flows. So conventional stormwater systems are designed to reduce flooding. And as you can see, the arrows indicate the flow of water. It's directed between the houses, to the roadside, to the gutters um, that direct the water to a storm drain. From there, it's piped into a large stormwater pond to hold it and hopefully treat the water before it's discharged off site. The other image on the right is an alternative approach to stormwater management. In this approach, the water is decentralized to hold and treat stormwater runoff close to where it's created. Um, so close to roof runoffs and things like that. Um, there, there's these little ponds are scattered throughout the neighborhood. They're not actually ponds, but rather shallow depressions where turf or or they can be planted, you know, as as shallow rain gardens. Um, so they're not actually ponds, um, which this image kind of makes them look like they're little ponds. But the advantage of these open drainage systems is that they create considerable less, uh, they cost considerably less, and they also um, um, provide better water quality treatment by by allowing the water to filter into the soil right, you know, right close to where it's at. Then what happens, and this image just talks about, you know, where the water goes after it's collected. So the water, you know, comes down, it runs off into the storm drain, um, you know, and here's a manhole. So the storm drains, um, you know, collect in, in the, the manhole and the catch basin, and then they're piped off and discharged into the nearest water body. Um, with Then, you know, there's really no treatment or anything involved in that. Um, I like to show this because um, I think there's a, a big misconception that somehow our water is treated before it's released again. And that's just simply not typically the case. This next image I have is um, some some typical non-point source pollution. So, so if we're looking at this, we can see some things that might be contributing to pollution and nutrient loading. One of them that you might notice here is grass clippings going into a storm drain or leaves. These, you know, you know, they're organic, right? But they do contain nutrients and, and we do want to keep them out of our storm drains. There may be things like pet raised or, you know, um, um, the downspouts um, directed down the driveway and into the storm drains. So this is just an example of some of the common things that we might see um, as we're driving around looking at neighborhoods and drainage issues. Um, next, I'm gonna show a short video. Um, so the sound should be on and, um, and it just explains um, non-point source pollution. If stormwater pollution was rubber duckies, it wouldn't matter what went down the storm drains. But it does, because stormwater pollution is not rubber duckies. It's soil, trash, oil, cigarette butts, and pet waste flowing untreated into our water. That's not good for any of us, because we all live downstream. Clean water starts with you. I think that video does a really good job of just explaining, you know, how, you know, non-point source is just really everywhere um, in our daily lives. So things to keep in mind. Um, so green stormwater infrastructure, or GSI as it's abbreviated, can be used to supplement or replace traditional gray stormwater infrastructure and manage the impacts of rain in urban stormwater areas. So GSI reduces pollution and treats stormwater by retaining rainfall near its source instead of directing it to a centralized pond or treatment system. Um, I've said that like three times now, so um, you probably are, are getting the, 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 the message now. But what I'd like to do is just quickly kind of compare gray stormwater to green. 
and gray stormwater is things like you know curbs and gutters and storm drains and you know it's the function is really to move that water quickly um, so to prevent flooding green stormwater infrastructure uses nature-based methods like rain gardens and pervious pavements to allow uh, stormwater to soak into the ground um, for water quality um, gray stormwater um, urban stormwater it centralizes the runoff and um, it you know does not treat it before release. With green stormwater infrastructure, it it you know runs through vegetation, um, and and that vegetation filters the water and it filters sediment and it reduces the nutrients um, naturally. Flood risk um, gray stormwater is probably really the the ultimate um, in reducing flood risk. Um, it quickly rede re redirects the water away from um, the homes and the streets. Um, and, and while it's really good for, for flood control, it's not as good for nutrient reduction. So we have to balance these two things. I, I wouldn't say that we would ever move totally away from gray stormwater. Um, there's certainly a need for it. Um, but, but there is also um, a lot of instances where green stormwater infrastructure can be very effective. Um, water supply. Um, once again, the gray stormwater, um, it reduces recharge because, you know, the water's moving off quickly, where the green stormwater, it really, um, it, the, the ultimate goal is for it to recharge the aquifer, um, you know, so it filters through our, our soils and, and um, enters our aquifer again and treats it so it can be drinking water. Cost um, gray infrastructure requires um, high capital cost for site grading, paving and piping. Um, green stormwater infrastructure can be relatively less cost, um, you know, less cost to install. And there can also be some other benefits to green stormwater infrastructure. And those include kind of aesthetic ben benefits. They also can turn into places where you would like to go. Um, so like some of these stormwater ponds that we see, um, these, these um, what am I trying to say, stormwater treatment ponds, um, where you'll see, um, you know, great birding opportunities or trails or hiking, you know, they really make them, you know, multi-use and, and um, they bring benefits to the community through these other resources. So now what I'd like to do, that's kind of the overview in the background on, on GSI. Um, and now what I'd like to do is talk to you about some residential scale drainage issues. And hopefully we'll give you some ideas and some guidance if you have any of these issues in your landscape or in your community on how you can address them. Um, and you know, so some of these drainage issues may include standing water, soggy areas, and misdirected downspouts. Um, Treatment swales are deterred an alternative to curb and gutter systems that you've probably seen. Um, they can't be used everywhere because the lack of space and density. So, you know, you need you certainly need wider roads and wider um, right of ways in order to be able to install a, a swale. But they, they're great at slowing the flow of stormwater and they allow the water to soak into the ground. Um, they also um, treat runoff by allowing the suspended solids and impurities to settle out of the stormwater but before it reaches that water source. So that's also another great um, you know, result of using swales rather than curbs and gutters. Um, and um, swales, they're, they're generally located in the common areas of a community and um, they are usually um, the responsibility of the CDD or the HOA, but maintenance is essential to ensure that the, the swale functions properly over time. So these maintenance suggestions include removing trash and debris, dead plant material and sediments. Um, you also need to repair any erosion issues that might come up. You want to restore the percolation rate. Um, you can do that by disking or tilling to aerate the bottom of the swale and create better percolation. You also need to maintain the swale blocks, outlets, and pavements. When you mow them, you want to mow them just as needed, and you want to keep that grass a little higher. So you want to keep it three to five inches long. And then lastly, you need to prune the vegetation as needed. So there may be other 
there may be other material there that needs to be pruned. But here in this image, you can see where the, the debris has just, um, the vegetation has just clogged the inlet there. Um, so those are just things to keep in mind with swales, but pretty much that, you know, there's not a lot of work that goes along with them. Misdirected downspouts are another thing that we commonly see. And what we mean by misdirected downspouts is, is the water is directed over, in this instance, over the walkway. So this is, um, this is certainly not ideal. This will get unsightly. Uh, you can already see where it's starting to turn the concrete dark, but it'll also get slippery and turn into a real hazard as you're walking up to the front door. So that's definitely something we'd want to avoid. The other thing is having the downspouts directed towards the driveway. Um, when that happens, um, the polluted water doesn't receive any type of treatment at all, and it's just discharged into our storm drains. So the better option in either one of these cases is to direct the water to a pervious area where it can be allowed to infiltrate into our groundwater. Um, so on this one, it would be really easy just to turn that um, downspout and let it soak into the landscape bed right here. You'll save water and um, you'll also, um, you know, help save the environment by having, you know, not polluted discharge. On this one, you know, even if they just took that downspout and, you know, had it sink into this bed, that would be a much better option than what we're seeing here. Um, downspout extenders are, um, these are a simple and easy way for anyone um, to, to deal with some of the, the water coming from their downspouts and directing it where you'd like it to go. Um, it's, it's super you know, easy to do yourself and you can buy the extenders um, hoses um, at the local box store and attach it to the end of your downspout. Um, they're flexible and they can be directed wherever you want them. And another option is to have an extender with holes like this one. Um, and what I like about it is it does, it rolls up when it's not in use. So um, when the water fills it up, it, it extends out, lets, lets the water out a little more gently. So you might not have as much erosion with a, a hose like this. And then it just rolls up and gets out of the way. But you should aim to have these downspout extenders at least two feet from the foundation of the home. So you're not, you know, interfering with, you know, any of your structural um, issues of your house. But so these are all really common, easy things that you can use. Um, dry wells, they're um, also a really good way um, to deal with extra water, especially when you don't have much space. Um, they're pretty easy to do it yourself. They slow the water so it can slowly infiltrate. Um, they can be placed at the end of a downspout to catch that extra water. And the size of these small dry wells is determined by the amount of water that, you know, you have to deal with. So you can get, you can get, um, you know, like small, medium, large um, dry wells, depending on what your needs are. And with Florida sandy soil, um, there's generally a high percolation rate. So a small well should be fine. But if you have clay soils or something like that, you might need a larger well. And these are, these are, like I said, pretty easy to do. What you do is you dig, uh, you dig a hole about twice the size of this little well. So it's a little canister well. So you dig the hole about twice the size of the, the well and six inches deeper. Um, then you line the hole with this, this filter fabric because um, you don't want the soil getting into the, um, the well and clogging it up or, or clogging up the, the, even the stones that are around it. Um, then, so you, you, um, you put six inches of stone on the bottom, you set the, the dry well on that, then you fill in all around the dry well with more stones. Um, you make sure it's level to the surrounding area, and then, um, you put the lid on it and you cover it back up with rocks. So this is, this is, um, you know, kind of a finished product. And these are really effective. Um, and like I said, they don't take up much space. So they can, um, you know, really be um, a good answer for a lot of different um, drainage issues. Um, a pipe drain with a pop out is kind of a, something you can do in addition to one of those dry wells. So you might have you might have a dry well here. And then what you would do is um, you could add a pipe to that. Um, and then you can um, attach one of these pop-outs to the end of that pipe. 
So one of the benefits is that when it's not in use, it, it closes, um, the little cap here closes, um, and, and that prevents small animals and debris from entering your drains. It uses hydrostatic pressure, so you don't have any power, anything to worry about um, like that when to operate the system. But it's best to use when there's a natural slope away from the house. And um, and you just really need to make sure, like I said, that, that you have positive drainage so it slopes away from the house and that it's at least 10 feet from a, um, the house. Um, so it's, you know, once again, not interfering with the foundation of your house. And here's one in action right here. So the water is coming out of it. And then um, after, you know, after the water is discharged, that little top just seals back down. Um, next, what I'm going to show um, a short video segment from the Flip My Florida Yard TV show. And it's going to talk about rain barrels and how rain barrels can be used to catch and contain some extra water from your roof. Water-friendly landscaping principle number two is to water efficiently. And principle number eight is to reduce stormwater runoff. The magic of a rain barrel? Well, it addresses... Claire, we lost the video. Sorry, can you hear it okay? Yep. Okay. Both of these principles. What's the value of a rain barrel? Why have a rain barrel? Oh, goodness. Okay, so we're in South Florida, and we get on average 55 to 60 inches of rain. Wow, a lot of rain. Free water. <laughs> and this is going to even, like, even reduce stormwater runoff. We're going to keep some of this water on property here, Absolutely. Correct? The yard is the first line of defense for protecting our natural resources. So you want to make sure that you recharge, and it stays within our landscape. This is a wonderful way to tell that water where to go capture it and be part of the solution. Well, let's talk about this barrel because we kind of recycled some pavers that Melissa had in the backyard. So we, we obviously want to build it up yep. some. Why do we want this rain barrel up? You want to have some gravity feed from it. If you have a watering can, you want to make sure you get to it. So you want to have at least that 24 inch. Because once this little baby gets full of water, it's going to weigh 450 yeah. pounds. Wow. Okay. Wow. And so that's going to happen pretty quick, isn't it? It does. It happens very quick. Typically, we're working with a home that has a gutter system where we can divert that water through the gutter system into the barrel. Melissa's house doesn't have a gutter system. So we're doing something a little bit different to get that water in the rain barrel. Lauren, what are we doing? We're doing something as simple as adding a rain chain. Okay. For those folks that don't have a gutter, that's the simplest thing that you can do to still be able to capture the water and tell it where you want it to go. Anyone can use um, a rain chain and the rain barrel. It's very simple. In fact, Extension provides workshops and trainings on how to uh, get one and install one. I've gone ahead and already installed a hook right into the fascia board. You have to hold on to me because okay. I'm, I'm going to go up there go and for it. come down, okay? So we're going to test the weight here. <laughs> test the weight. Here we go. I'm going up. Going go for up. it. Go for it. I got you. Oh, God, I got it. Yes. Let's test it. Let's go for it. Yeah. Then we get a hose. Go for it. Oh, there you go. There, there you go. go. There now you it's go. working. So that's diverting that water. It's going to take it right down in that barrel. Very easy. We're rain chaining. It's really fun to watch it. It is fun to watch it, but you know what? We're soaked. We're soaked. <laughs> <laughs> Visit FloridaFriendlyLandscaping.com to start learning today. I love frogs. So um, I'm sorry about that. I, I um, the quality of that looked really poor on on my end. It had looked, you know, it didn't look so grainy. So I apologize for the graininess of that video. Um, um, but I, I thought they did a great job of talking about rain barrels and, and how they could be, you know, easily installed. Um, rain gardens are a great way um, for low spots in the yard that tend to hold water. Um, you know, start thinking about a rain garden. Um, they treat, filter, and uh, allow water to infiltrate into the ground slowly. And um, they should really include plants that tolerate short-term flooding as well as periods of drought. So they, they, we ask a lot of a rain garden, but we have plants that can do that. So um, we have lists on, on, I can pop some in our chat box at the end, or um, you, know, you, know, you can reach out to me and I can provide you with some resources on different plants that would be appropriate for a rain garden. Um, so like plants on the, the berm, you know, need to be able to, you know, have, withstand dry situations and plants that are in the middle in the more wet areas need to be able to, to tolerate 
more inundation and 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 flooding, occasional flooding. Um, so in central Florida, some plants that might be a good option would be things like canna lily or swamp sunflower, different ferns are a great option, um, iris, swamp hibiscus. So you can have a lot of color. They really, they're a pretty little garden um, and they don't require much maintenance. So rain gardens are, are certainly something to keep in mind for the home landscape. Um, we definitely have information on how to construct the rain gardens and where to construct them. Um, we didn't have time to get into that um, on today's webinar, but like I said, I'd be happy to provide resources for that. Permeable pavers um, are a great solution for high traffic areas. They allow for infiltration between the gaps of the pavement, um, and sometimes the pavers themselves um, allow for water inf infiltration. So depending on what type of plant uh, paver you choose, you can fill it with stones or plant material such as grasses. These pavers need to be set on a bed of graded base material to allow for infiltration. Um, as you see in, in this image here, um, you have different types of rocks, so that allows um, the, the debris to be filtered um, through the, the rock material and then down into the subsoil. Um, I, I have another video here showing how effective these pavers can be, um, and we'll see how this one turns out. Quickly water absorbs into the soil. It's easy to understand the importance of the Florida friendly principle fertilize appropriately. One All right, unleash it. Wow, look at that. It's all gone. It can be thousands of inches an hour. You can put five times the amount of area can drain to a permeable pavement area because it's so pervious. Can take water so quickly and then allow it to drain into. So I think that is really, really spectacular to see that water just kind of disappear. So I don't think we often think about, um, you know, that for home landscapes and, and how we can use those um, more effectively. But pavers are a great option um, to keep in mind for, for your driveways and things like that if you're experiencing flooding issues. Another option that I think is a little more expensive than pavers, but there's permeable concrete and asphalt. These are also great for high traffic areas. You, you'll see them in yeah, parking lots really often, driveways, walking trails sometimes. Um, sometimes part of the area will have um, permeable and part will be regular. Um, and this is a really quick little video showing you just the, pretty much the same as that last one. It's a pleasure to be but it's just kind of um, stunning to see how the water just disappears. So underneath that pavement, there'll be um, tanks, holding tanks, civet cells, things like that to collect that water, um, if you were wondering where the water went. Um, here today. And um, next, I'm going to kind of switch gears here a little bit. We're going to talk about the, the swales between houses. This is a really common, if, if um, you know, do you have this in your community? You're, we're seeing a lot more of this, especially in new construction, where there's, you know, pretty thin space in between the houses. And usually there's a lot of utilities there, things like that. But they're, they tend to be really hard to get plant, and especially turf material to grow um, because it, it's, it gets quite wet because it's getting runoff from, you know, both sides, right? Both houses are contributing to this little area. And then um, it tends to be shady as well. So it, it's a tough growing environment for almost anything. Um, so if you're struggling in those areas, um, you might be able to, um, there's a couple different suggestions we have. So you might be able to um, eliminate some of the irrigation. Um, so, so in those narrow areas with less than five feet, you can turn off one side of the irrigation. So um, you could just like turn off that whole side, or you can alter if you've got two different homeowners, that way they kind of split the bill where, you know, say this head is on, um, this head's off, um, or, or this head's on, this head's off, this head's on, things like that. And, and then you would alternate with the neighbor so that you get full coverage. But that would be one way. Another way is just to have them all down one side. Um, you could try planting with a, a uh, hardy ground cover, 
this is Asiatic Jasmine. It's a really tough one. So that might be a good option. Um, or you can even try just using some hardscape elements like a, a paver pathway and, and different plants on either side. Um, but we're seeing these areas more and more in between the houses. It's really a common building practice. Um, so if you haven't seen it yet, you might come across it um, soon. <laughs> So stormwater treatment ponds, um, you know, since 1982, um, Florida state statutes have required that rainfall landing on newly constructed impervious surfaces. Those are things such as rooftops, streets, parking lots, et cetera. They must be treated before um, turning into runoff that leaves the property. Um, the pollutants in the stormwater runoff, they include heavy metals, fertilizers, pesticides, trash, bacteria, and sediment. These are the biggest sources of water quality problems for the state. So more so than ever, um, it, more so than even industrial um, and agricultural sources. So new developments are required to treat that runoff. This may be accomplished by several different methods. Um, the most common are, are still large stormwater ponds, like we talked about at the beginning of this um, webinar. Um, but stormwater ponds are defined as either retention or detention ponds. So dry retention ponds typically allow water to infiltrate into the soil. Um, and in contrast, detention ponds capture stormwater runoff and store it before slowly releasing the water downstream. So I'm sure you've seen both examples of dry retention and certainly stormwater ponds. So the function of stormwater ponds is pr to prevent flooding, right? It's also, um, we want it to treat stormwater runoff by allowing this particulates to settle down at the bottom of the pond rather than running off site. But the issue is um, that, you know, residents want green lawns and they want blue lakes, but often those two things can compete with each other. The more the landscape is fertilized and irrigated, the more nutrients end up in our ponds, creating poor water quality. So how can we balance these aesthetics with good water quality? And that's really kind of the big question that, that a lot of us are grappling with. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to look at each one of these things and, and see if we can't come up with some, some you know, ideas that can help out um, you know, first of all, we need to start off with, you know, everybody wants a green lawn and everybody wants to live on a lake. And as you can see on this image, there are 21 homes that are directly impacting each one of these lakes. Um, you want to remember that the community is, the whole community is designed to, dr to drain into these lakes. So everything that is not used up by the landscape ends in these lakes. Um, and these homes are also, you know, sold at a premium price too, because they're waterfront. So, you know, I think everybody wants that water to be blue, um, like the ones in these pictures. It's really beautiful, right? Um, but the problem is most Floridians don't live on a lake. They live on a stormwater pond. Um, so this is a picture of a stormwater pond. And, you know, I think this is a beautiful one. I would be really happy to, to live on this. I'm sure that there's a lot of wildlife and, um, you know, a lot of activity around this lake. That would be really interesting to to see. Um, so that's, you know, one of the benefits of a stormwater pond. But, um, you know, they can also look like this when there's too many inputs. So I don't think anybody wants to live on this one. Um, and we know the inputs that are contributing to poor water quality and algal growth. These can, you know, I mentioned them earlier, they can be, you know, fertilizer and, and pesticides and just general, you know, pollution, non point source pollution that we talked about earlier. So some of the things that we can do to help this is practice um, best management practices for stormwater ponds or stormwater pond BMPs. So many homeowners don't connect their landscape design and maintenance practices to the problems in their stormwater ponds. Highly maintained lawns direct discharge of stormwater into ponds, which causes most of the weedy growth in these ponds. And one of the most important steps is to have a to have a more attractive stormwater pond is to form a partnership with the people in the community. So really talking to your neighbors and also to the people who are maintaining the ponds um, so that you're all on the same page. Um, easier said than done, but it's very effective if, if you all can get on the same page with your pond maintenance. 
One thing you can do is reduce fertilizer input, which helps to build the pond's natural defenses. Some of the fertilizer BMPs are never fertilized before a heavy rain, um, never fertilized within 10 feet of any water body. Don't use weed and feed. Use a broadcast spreader, spreader with a defect, deflector shield that keeps the water out of the pond. Um, apply only when the grass is actively growing so the grass uptakes the nutrients and always read and follow the fertilizer label. Um, source control, um, the reduction of fertilizer and pesticides will always be the best defense, but pond edge plantings can play a role as well. So installing a 10 to 20 foot buffer zone between the landscape and the shoreline is a great thing to do. It absorbs nutrients before they enter the pond. It provides habitat for wildlife. It prevents erosion and it enhances the beauty of the pond. So you, you might want to protect your view with low ground covers. That's something we hear a lot is, you know, I don't, you know, they bought, they spent a lot of money to buy their house on the, the pond. So they don't want to block that view, but you can still accomplish these things with low growing ground covers or breaks in, in taller vegetation. So you have kind of a window to see through. Um, and uh, just one other thing to keep in mind when you're, you're planting a buffer or anything like that is that there are requirements um, that are county and, and city specific ordinances. So make sure that you check with your extension office before planting or removing anything along the shore's edge. That said, aquatic plants can reduce shoreline erosion, and what you want, you want to try to aim for at least one third of the pond to be maintained um, with a shallow littoral shelf of aquatic plants. Um, so that would be that would be kind of this area right in here um, that we have plants. Um, and then the no-mo zone here, um, you know, the 10 to 20 foot along the bank, um, it's just a double insulation for that pond. Um, so that's a really great design right there. Um, and what I'd like to do on this is kind of show you. So I'd like you to compare this area here where we're seeing pretty significant erosion, where we don't really have any plants or anything like that. So the shoreline is eroding and, and this can turn into a real problem. But where we do have those littoral plantings back here in this corner, you can see how stabilized that bank is. So those are really things that we, we want to encourage people to do. Um, Aeration is also another great thing to do. So water exposed to the air typically has a higher dissolved oxygen concentration. So that's great for the, the pond water itself. It's a great for the, the organisms, the fish and everything else that are in the ponds. And to do this, you can use fountains. Those would be used in ponds that are less than eight feet deep. Or if you've got deeper ponds than that, you can use bottom diffusers or bubblers. So those are also great options for ponds. Some practical maintenance guidelines for ponds um, are removing debris, especially at the inflow and outflow. Um, you know, give special attention to the drains and drop boxes. This will reduce the amount of pollutants that the pond will have to remove. You wanna inspect the entire stormwater system on an annual or semi-annual basis and make brief inspection tips um, trips after each storm just to see what came down. Cleaning up debris is an important part of the inspection. So leaves, limbs, other debris should be removed from the conveyance system. And you wanna make sure that the discharge of your mower is not directed toward the pond. We don't want those grass clippings to end up in the pond. Um, and if you have one of those no mow areas, that will that will help that, um, you know, help, help you not get those grass clippings in the pond itself. And stormwater ponds need to be cleaned out periodically. Um, this is kind of a, a you know dirty little secret. About every 25 years or so is the general um, guidelines. And that means, you know, like it could they need dredging and things like that to keep them functioning properly. And you'll want to consult a professional for information on the methods that can be used for the proper proper disposal of dredge materials. And, um, and, you know, something to keep in mind that an efficient functioning stormwater system takes as much time and effort as maintaining the rest of the landscape. So it's it's a part of the landscape and, you know, needs to be, you know, included in our maintenance calculations as such. 
Um, and, and lastly, who's responsible for maintaining the ponds? It's typically the HOA or CDD, um, could be the property association, but in some cases it can also be the county or municipality. And, um, you know, there's permitting and there's a, there's a lot involved in ponds. So, um, you know, these were just kind of some high level things to keep in mind when, when you're maintaining a pond. And um, let's see how many questions, Dylan. Okay, I'm gonna, right now, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some of the resources that we have available um, for folks to help with their landscaping practices. Um, and, you know, you may know that the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program has an extensive amount of educational materials available to encourage more sustainable landscaping practices. These, these pictures here are our old publications, and I, I'm only showing them to you because hopefully you've seen them before, and I'd like to, um, we have redesigned them, so I just want to make you aware that this is, these are the same publications. They've been updated with, um, you know, the latest recommendations, um, but this is what they look like now. So we have a book, Handbook for Home Landscapes, that goes through the nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping. We have the Plant Selection and Landscape Design book that has, you um, different plants in it and what their growing needs and conditions are. Um, and then we have the best management practices for um, protection of water resources by the green industries. And that's really for our professional audiences. Um, we've also developed several mobile web applications. The Florida Friendly um, Landscaping Plant Guide is available online and lists more than 400 Florida Friendly plants. Um, it's available on your phone, on your tablet, on your home computer. It's basically very similar to that book that I just showed you, um, except for, you know, you have it on your phone. Um, you can also download it as Apple or Android. These are all free, all these apps. And so, um, you know, visit our website and try them out. We also have um, um, the FFL Butterfly Garden app, which provides butterfly host and nectar plants and sample planting designs for small, medium, and large butterfly gardens. We created um, a bee app that's very similar to the butterfly app. Um, we have a Florida fertilizer app for professionals to um, help keep track of all the various city and county fertilizer ordinances. And it uses Google Maps um, to pinpoint the exact location and let you know what fertilizer restrictions are um, in place. And then we have a toxic plant app that includes over 200 plants. This can be filtered by whether it's toxic to people, plants, or pests. And, um, and it can be filtered by the symptoms of the poison, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and we've talked a lot about green stormwater infrastructure today. We have started a, a GSI maintenance certification program. This is really more for municipalities. I'm just kind of letting you know about it. Um, but we saw a need for that as you know some of these systems are going in and maybe not being maintained correctly. So um, we have this maintenance training. It's a hybrid. There'll be online modules and an in-person field module. And um, along with that, we have a manual, we have checklists and a plant selection guide that goes along with that whole program. Um, they're avail available on our website and you can download any of these things from our website. Um, and um, so I hope you'll visit that. We partner with um, DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, and we created the Florida GSI website. Um, it has a lot of great information. It has brochures you can download and print, um, a presentation that you can give if you want to you know, talk to your people or your community about this. It has technical manuals and a plant guide. Um, so it's just a really good, the idea behind that website is it's a clearinghouse of Florida-specific green stormwater infrastructure materials. And then next, I just want to announce that we have a casting call out for Flip My Florida Yard season four. Um, this one, I think, is going to be developed a little bit different than our other ones, where we might have too many flips and then we'll visit a mature landscape. But we'll have, um, we'll have I think there's going to be eight this season. Um, so eight different episodes. And um, if you're interested, you can visit um, the flipmyfloridayard.com um, to submit your your um, home for um, a you know, possible flip. Um, sorry, I didn't say that very well. Um, and then I think I think this is my last slide. Um, so I'm coming to an end here. Um, I just also want to announce that we launched our awards program. It closes September 15th. 
The winners will be announced um, in later October. And really the goal of these awards is to highlight and celebrate the people and projects that are creating attractive and sustainable landscapes in Florida. So please consider entering our awards. We have all kinds of different landscape awards. We have, you know, just, we have residential landscape, we have new construction. We have, um, we have a photo contest, so before and after, we have a mature landscape, and then also education awards. Um, so with that, I will um, take any questions. My contact information is here, and um, please feel free to reach out to me with any questions that you might have. Fantastic. What a comprehensive presentation. Thank you so much, Claire. And hopefully- you your, Stop sharing. Yep, hopefully you provided a little bit of inspiration for everyone. We do have um, some questions in the chat. So I'm gonna start with the participant questions and then I'll go back if we have time to um, some of um, Vincent's questions. So the first one is, would you be willing to share the link to the rubber ducky video? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will. Um, that was, it It was, um, it was funded, I think, through EPA, so it is um, open source. Um, it was developed for Maine and Think Blue, but it is open source, so we can use it. <laughs> Great, thank you. And while we're going through um, the the questions, I'm going to launch the poll. This is a, a really quick evaluation for you all, just to let us know um, what you what you learned here. And thank you, Vincent, for reminding me. Okay, the next question is, um, are rain chains better than downspouts? Um, well, yeah, all right, so that's a little subjective, right? Um, better, but um, I think they're probably, I think downspouts capture more of the water. Um, so I think rain chains are a great option when you don't have downspouts installed on your house and you know they're a way to direct that runoff. Um, but you know, gutter systems, are a full system around the house or around areas of the house. So they're gonna, they are gonna capture more of that water and direct it to one spot. Um, but rain chains are great when you don't have gutters, but you do have a little rain, say that you wanna, you know, keep away from say your front door or something like that. And that's a great way to direct it. I think they're really pretty too. And <laughs> they are pretty. <laughs> um, next question is how do you, um, maintain permeable concrete, asphalt, and or pavers? So it, there is some some maintenance that goes along with that. And, um, you know, typically for, um, you know, large commercial sites, they'll rent vacuums, you know, these trucks that go around and vacuum up the um, the debris. For kind of smaller sites and, and residential, I think you, you, you need to blow them off. Um, I, could, I think there's a document that talks about residential maintenance of these systems. You don't see that, you don't see like that happen as much. So I think mostly they're maintained by blowing off the debris and trying to keep them clear. Great, thank you. The next one is um, what messaging would you use or, or how would you explain to a resident why you shouldn't use a weed and feed product? <laughs> I, I had a hard time with this for a while, but what happens with weed and feed is, you know, it puts down both a weed suppressant and, you know, fertilizer. So what happens is neither one of them that are getting, you know, applied at the right time. So typically you'd want to apply your um, pre-emergent um, earlier in the year. And then, you know, you would feed your turf later on in the year after, you know, after it, the, it starts to grow. So you apply the, the, the pre-emergent before, you know, the growing season really kicks off and then, and then fertilizer would be applied later in the year. Great, thank answers. you. The next question, um, Donald says that Lee County has a newish organization. It's called wetplan.org. And he's wondering if there's anything like this statewide. And I just went to the website and what it is, is an education program um, for residents in improving and caring for their neighborhood lakes and ponds. And so I believe that you do, we do have a, a lake and pond maintenance educational program. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. 
We do. And um, so we have a great program that was developed um, down in Manatee and Sarasota counties. Um, and it, it was called Healthy Ponds. Um, that program has been transferred to Florida Friendly. So it's going to be, we've rebranded it at Florida Friendly Ponds. We will be launching that program again later in this year. And um, it will be a hybrid program, like I talked about earlier, we'll, where there'll be online education and, and, and a tiered program too. So like we, we want it to be available for people who you know live in communities or are on HOA boards to be able to take the class. And then also people who are managing ponds will have a more intensive um, tier to this, this, this um, program. Um, but this information, I mean, we've got more than 76,000 ponds across the state. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of them are getting to the age where they really need, you know, quite a bit of, of maintenance to happen. So I think this this pond certification is is something that's really needed. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to getting that launched. When it was transferred to us, they asked us to update it. Um, it wasn't that we found anything wrong with the program at all. It's a fantastic program. It's pretty interactive. So when you do the online classes, you'll you'll chat with the other people in the class. And then the, the field module will be a great just, you know, applied learning day. Um, so is that yeah. live or is that coming soon? It's coming soon. Um, it'll be it'll be launched by the end of the year. And I'd like to write down what was the name of it? What are what was it called? Wetplan.org. Awesome. Um, I, you know the education is needed. We we um, I think are almost in like a crisis situation with some of our stormwater ponds across the state. Um, and you know I didn't mention it in this presentation, but they're they're showing. I'm sure some of your other speakers have talked about this. Uh, but, you know, they're they're showing that stormwater ponds, like they might, you know, account for about 30 percent removal of, um, of you know, some of the pollutants, which isn't, you know, which isn't really high. But that's not what they were intended really for. They were intended for, for flooding. Um, so that's why we need, you know, we can supplement our stormwater ponds with some of these other GSI systems. Um, so you have just a, a couple Comments. Um, Cleta is totally inspired. And Delphin says, thank you so much. This is helping me get to my goal of being a hydrologist. So <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have another question. Melanie asks um, if there are any apps that exist or are in the works that relate to irrigating lawns, since over irrigation contributes greatly to runoff issues. At least I see you turned off here. Your mic on that one. Um, <laughs> there are. Um, I, I know. Um, although I don't have their exact names right off the bat here, but I know um, Fawn has one. Um, I IFAS has a, an irrigation app. I just don't. I can't think of the name of it right now. Um, I, I and there's a whole series of irrigator, um, which is pretty, you know, pretty um, catchy. Um, the irrigator has videos and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. I, I I think there is an app, but I don't know it. Well, ask Vincent behind the scenes to see if he can find it while okay. we're <laughs> we're doing the rest of our questions. <laughs> um, a Lisa, couple... what, what, what would you like me to look up? Oh, see if there's a, what the irrigation app is. Thank you. Um, just some comments that. Um, many lawn companies blow debris into the street. And so um, I don't know if you want to address that at all, but just a comment. Well, I, I you know, it's really just a comment. I, it's certainly not an answer, but um, I live in Alachua County and they did a campaign a number of years ago where they were like, and I don't remember the exact words of it, but they were like, professionals don't blow into the street, you know, and they had, you know, they had a little slogan and, and, you know, I think it was kind of effective, although it was almost a shaming type of campaign. Um, so I think they moved away from it, you know, because they were trying to shame those folks into not blowing the debris into the street. But I, I think it worked. Um, but, you know, it's really what it did was raise awareness of, you know, of everybody, of the professionals, but also of the residents to, you know, say something when they see it. Um, 
I know my neighbor, I, I told him a couple times and he still just, he, he blows all his stuff out into the street and you're like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, there's also evidence um, shaving campaigns also work for um, picking up dog poop. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they're right. the place right. for them. <laughs> um, Donald says, when doing HOA walkthroughs, consultation ponds, retention, and detention are hard for folks to grasp, especially when there are other waterfronts on rivers or canals. A big issue is who is responsible? Is there a way for folks to sleuth out who's responsible for their particular waterways? Ooh. Um, I wish I could tell you that. It is... I think it is a bit of a needle in a haystack. Um, I, you know, certainly going, if you're in an H, if you're in an HOA, you can go to your HOA. Some of these things are also available on, um, in the, in the county. Um, and, and I'm not sure who you talk to, to find out exactly like what department kind of thing you would find out but um it is really all over the board who who is you know responsible sometimes it's what you know who i think houses that and lisa you may know it it might be the water management districts who gave the permit for the pond in the first place they might be a great resource to go to 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 and and you know i it'll be different for each community or each water body but you know that i think that would be a great place to start yeah, yes, so for those of you in Martin County, we're in the South Florida Water Management District. Um, going back to earlier questions, Vincent asks, um, are municipalities becoming more open to vegetating swales beyond just turf grass? He recalls the Save Our Swales effort um, a few years ago in Southwest Florida. Man, I love that. Save Our Swales. That's fantastic. <laughs> Um, I don't think that they're actually more open to them at yet, yet, you know, um, it, you know, it comes down, I, I think we're all still kind of reeling from COVID and, you know, um, reduced amount of, um, what do you say? Um, just maintenance workers and things like that. Like I, it's, it comes to enforcement and maintenance and it's easier for a city right now to to mow than it is to, to maintain a swale um, that's planted. Uh, hopefully, you know, it, hopefully with education and really showing the benefits and things like that, um, people will get more open. And boy, I just, I want to do a campaign on Save My Swales. So that's, that's amazing. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have a lot of great presentation. Thank you so much for all this amazing um, information. So this is very well received. We have one, I think, um, one last question maybe before we before we have to leave. Uh, Tanya says we have a local company drilling narrow deep holes in yards and such to allow stormwater to quickly seep into the ground. Is that process any worry for the aquifer? Essentially nasty runoff, not getting the natural filtration. I've never heard of that happening. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, um, it, I I missed your name again. Um, but I think she's right. Like that does not. I mean, there is no treatment going into that water. They they do. You know, you, there are times where um, you know, I think a water management district or some of these bigger entities will will put water underground as as a storage and as a way of treatment. But but just drilling holes all over the yard for quick infiltration, that seems to defeat what we're talking about here. So um, what we're trying to do is really slow that infiltration um, and, and you know, just, you know, really get it cleaned before it hits aquifer, not, not just pump it in there. <laughs> yeah. And I guess maybe this was a comment, so I don't know if you want to just speak to it, but um, Neighbors putting in artificial turf. Any comments or thoughts on that? <laughs> you know what my thought is on that is it's contagious. <laughs> I've seen it in a neighborhood near my house where you know one person put it in and then and then now we have like five people with the the artificial turf. Um, Florida friendly does have a whole edis on that, and um, I've got some some great resources on um, synthetic 
turf. It, we don't consider that a good option. Um, I know the synthetic turf companies are saying that they're making it so it's more permeable and allowing, um, you know, because because basically when they install the artificial turf, they do it on basically like a roadbed, right? So they 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 have a substrate and you know then they have you know fines or, or dirt on top of it and they pack it down and then they put you know the carpet on top of it. And that's you know that's to keep it level, you know, so it needs it needs all that prep to keep it level and flat. Um but um, it, you know, they don't necessarily perk, and they're very, very hot um, environments. Um, doesn't support, you know, any kind of wildlife or biodiversity. Um, so, it, you know, there there may be some instances where artificial turf could be used, but it, we don't consider that a Florida friendly um, or environmentally friendly approach. Well, you're having a special request to do a presentation on uh, artificial turf awareness. So maybe we'll have you back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, with that, it's one o'clock. I want to thank you so much for obviously a really engaging um, presentation and topic. And um, thank you for you know speaking to the water ambassadors and to addressing all of their questions. So, well, thank you thank, so and thank you all for joining us for um, another webinar series. And we look forward to seeing you next month on um, the topic is going to be uh, South Florida Water Management District, large scale water resource projects in the Indian River Lagoon region. So um, thank you, everyone. And I'm still recording. Ooh, let me stop.